Hello and welcome to another episode of Monster Island Radio. I'm Ben and joining me today of course is... Graham, hi. Hi, how are you doing? Not bad. So, you've been looking forward to this one? Um, in as much that the Millennium Era is coming to a close, yes I was, but I didn't really know what to expect except that we were going to see a lot of stuff all mm. at once. Mm. So, yeah. Okay. So yeah, today we're talking about Godzilla Final Wars. Yes. So released in 2004, it was the final film for the Millennium Era, uh, and also the last Godzilla Toho film until Shin Godzilla in 2016. Um, yeah, I'd been looking forward to this one for quite a while actually, because I remember when we were at uni, I remember seeing parts of it. Oh yeah. And I can't remember how or why, but I remember thinking it looked like so over the top, but I never actually got around to watching it until now so yeah it was a uh, been a long build up for this one and did you watch the western version or the japanese version or both i watched both oh all right okay yeah. I, I watched just the the dubbed version shall we say mm, okay i mean well kind of stepping on the rest of the podcast a little bit but there really wasn't much difference to be honest so oh, okay yeah you're, you're not missing anything either way anyway let's do a, li- a little wrap up for those who haven't seen it since 2004 um okay so it's difficult to condense this one as a result of years of environmental disasters the world sees the rise of giant monsters and superhuman mutants um the latter of which are recruited into the earth defense force to battle the giant monsters um one of the mutants is ozaki and he's given the role of a bodyguard to biologist otanashi from the un who is there to study the mummified remains of gigan it turns out the DNA of Gigan contains M-base, which is also found in mutants, effectively making them descendants, in a manner of speaking, to Gigan. Ooh. Oh, very interesting. The Shobijin twins then appear and tell of how uh, Gigan appeared 12,000 years ago on Earth and was defeated by Mothra and that a big battle uh, was coming soon and Ozaki will have to choose a side. Shortly thereafter... Uh, there is a massive outbreak of giant monsters attacking numerous locations across the globe. Shortly after, the EDF try and fend them off, but the monsters soon get abducted by a giant UFO belonging to the Zillion alien race, or Exilion. Zillion? I'm going to say Zillion. Um, <laughs> who appeared on Earth to warn of a planet called Gorath and its imminent collision with Earth. Oh. Mm. A treaty is agreed upon by Earth and the Zillions to help stop the collision, but we discover that it was just subterfuge, as the Zillions had actually replaced the EDF members with duplicates. What? Their, yeah. Their true plan was revealed by their leader X to enslave the humans and use them as a food source. The Zillions could control the mutants and monsters through the M-base in their DNA and take control and took control of a group of mutants and monsters and raise Gigan from his mummified state uh, and attack the EDF. So the EDF team head to Antarctica to awaken frozen Godzilla to battle the monsters and the Zillions as they know his DNA does not contain M-Base and therefore he cannot be controlled. Uh, He beats the horde of giant monsters and destroys the recently summoned planet Gorath before it collides with Earth, but as a result ends up unleashing Monster X-2. The two begin to fight at the same time as the EDF are fighting X aboard the mothership. Um, Neo, I mean Ozaki, learns that he and X are part of a rare breed of mutant called Kaiser and have human and mutant DNA and aren't subject to the mind control of M-Base but can in fact control M-Base themselves. After defeating X, the EDF managed to escape the ship as it self-destructs but uh, Monster X is clearly not under the control of the Zillions as he transforms into Kaiser Ghidorah. After a heated battle, Goji blasts Kaiser Ghidorah into space, destroying him uh, he then turns his attention towards the humans to destroy them too, but is soon calmed down by the appearance of his own son, Manila, who convinces him to forgive the humans for their misgivings. Uh, Godzilla and Manila both head back to the sea, and peace is returned once more. So, right, there's so much going on in this story. It's, it was di- difficult to figure out what was going on a lot of the time. Mm. He had lots of, you know, kind of shoehorned in action sequences in this big convoluted storyline <laughs> it's, it's so hard to kind of pin this down yeah, it's a lot uh, to do about nothing really isn't it basically yeah the whole so, movie I mean, is just like lots of faff and not I mean it, it's this thing that I think 
when a movie it has a bad story and then is poorly executed it's like you feel like you've lost track of the the plot sometimes yeah because there were points when i mean for example there's this threat of the planet gorath colliding yeah. with earth and then it turns out oh no it's a hologram it's fake but then it turns out to be real anyway mm. and you feel like what have i missed here it's just the fact that so little is going on that you actually kind of lose track of it because it's like it, it's it's making out like there's more to it than there really is Mm. And so your brain is like kind of working harder than it needs to to keep track of something, which is actually quite simple. And the movie's distracting you from the simplicity with all this like flashy stuff. Yeah, and it's like, oh, what? I I don't know what's going on. It's like you do know you do know what's going on. It's just that the movie is trying to distract you from the fact that the story is actually not very good. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, I, it's just lo- lots of things added in that I just felt complicated it. Absolutely. I mean, so you got these rare breeds of the mutants, which is what X and Ozaki were, right? Mm-hmm. And does that mean they're related to the Zillion alien race? Like, like he's an alien, right? This guy. But didn't um, they like X? use like? Didn't they make uh, Gigan, right? The aliens did, right? So oh, I there's see. like a connection there. So it's like they are kind of all one and the same. So they sort of are related I in a very see. very I distant see. way. I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got that artifact from the Shobujin twins. The little dagger thing. Yeah, for some reason. Talisman. Did they, did they use that? Yes. Um, I can't remember. I don't blame you. Um, <laughs> there's plenty of things in your synopsis that I was like, oh, yeah, because I forgot. But with the talisman, um, it looks like a dagger, and then it's revealed to be a dagger because when it needs to be, it sort of transforms a little bit, I think. And there's a scene where um, uh, they're, they're fighting on the alien ship at the, at the end, and that, that scientist from, from the UN the lady mm-hmm. she's like i'm gonna help so she like stabs a guy with it and helps out like in the fight so that's when oh it. yes yeah 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 okay <laughs> <laughs> but basically it's like that the whole way through where you're like there's this story going on there's this mutant guy who's like really powerful and then some aliens come and then they fight the aliens and it's like okay what does that really have to do with godzilla or any of the monsters in the story and the answer is it has nothing to do with that yeah. at all. Um, it's it's like you're watching a movie that's 90 minutes and that's the alien stuff with the mutants. And then there's also like this half an hour Godzilla episode that's been split up into little pieces and sort of sprinkled throughout it. And it's like yeah. you could totally remove all of the kaijus from this film and it wouldn't change the story at all. Yeah, that's true, actually. That is very true. I, uh, the, I mean, the aspects of the story that I actually liked were basically the parts that were just a vehicle for more monster action. Yeah, you know? um, the monster fights certainly have a certain style as well. Yeah, I mean, well, we'll get onto that in a minute. Yeah, but, okay, um, but basically, it seemed like oh, we need a reason monsters are fighting. Mm. So let's have you know aliens take control of them, and then you know very simple bad guy plot. Yeah, but I, I didn't mind because yeah, you know, I like the fights anyway. So, but then conversely. I disliked it when it came to any of the human stuff because the um, director, uh, Yuhei Kitamura, he clearly wanted to remake The Matrix inside a Godzilla film. The Matrix Reloaded specifically. Yes. Uh, so he contrived all these moments for humans to fight and like, you know, played heavily on all the uh, Matrix-style elements like the heavy colour grading, the bullet time 360 shots, and even like, you know, the hero being awoken and being able to stop bullets. It's like... It's the exact same shot from Reloaded. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just uh, and uh, there are there are times when I I like homage to movies and there are times when I don't. It's not homage this though, is, what is it? A, when they're just copying it. Yeah, exactly. It, it came out feels, a year later and they just they just lifted it basically. Yeah, and it just it just feels childish, like a kid going, yeah, you know, look at me, I can do it too. You know, it's just a bit kind of a kid at home with a camera. You know, it's like trying to make the movie for himself. Yeah, and it was just it was just a bit. I don't know, and I, I've never been a particular fan of the Matrix anyway. So all of that was kind of a snooze for me. Well, it's the superficial stuff that brings it down in The Matrix itself. It's like the first movie mm. has quite a lot of meat to it. You know, that's that's the really good one. And then Reloaded, if you're going to copy a Matrix movie, like don't copy Reloaded because <laughs> it's so superficial and it's just like stopping bullets it's, and it's no the cycles. Movie. Yeah, and it's like there's nothing there. And they take, well, I guess they kind of do take the best bits of Reloaded and shove them into this movie, but because you've just mm. recognised them as like, oh, that's the bullet shot where Neo stops the bullets. It's like, well, that's all you think about. It's not 
this, you don't think about the reasoning behind it all. Yeah, they just thought, oh, that's exactly what you're saying. Like, that's cool. We'll do that. Oh, motorcycle chase. That's cool. We'll do that. And it's like, mm. that isn't the reason people liked The Matrix in the first place. And it shouldn't really be emulated just for no apparent reason anyway. It's just so mm. weird. It's funny. It's kind of come full circle because Matrix is inspired by things like, you know, Akira and Ghost in the Shell. Mm. And then it's going back to Japan and being copied. But <laughs> arguably worse. Definitely worse. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, if you just took that, I don't know, the human action out of it, I feel like it would have been much better. Like, it didn't need to be there at all. Oh, I don't know that you really could, though, because it's a lot like, of what I mean, drives... That bike fight, like, what, what was the point? Oh, well, yeah, you could remove it in, in that sense that there's no real point to it, but the the motivation of the human characters is that they're gonna there's gonna be conflict, isn't there? There's gonna be a physical kind of conflict. Hmm. Um so in that regard it's like if you take that out, all you've got is a bunch of people talking because the things that the people talk about don't really relate to Godzilla at all. So it's like it's just such a mess that you've got two completely dissident things where you have like human action and monster action. It's just like you don't need them together. Like they don't go. So if to me when it's like you say like oh we could take out the human action and it would improve it if you take if you start to take components out it starts to fall apart even more to me well apparently the original script had a lot more rhyme and reason for everything that was happening as well okay so like but after the rewrite the action was left in but without a lot of that kind of story uh, to back it up that so often happens when yeah yeah and yeah that's a common it's, thing i think and like apparently kitamura was saying that he didn't want to focus on the human characters because he got sick of watching a watching a Godzilla film and being like, oh, why are, they t- why are we watching humans talking about how to stop Godzilla rather than, you know, actually stopping him? Yeah. And it's like, well, the, you know, you, you put 20 extra minutes of human fighting and yammering and, like, you could have just taken it out and I feel like it wouldn't have made any difference. Yeah, I, I, yeah, overall, I agree. Yeah, you could have just, like, I would like to see, like, if we just skipped over that motorcycle chase... Then. That one, that one was particularly egregious, I think. But it is also quite fun to watch from a schlocky point of view. So it's like, should we look at it not so much that it's that this movie is blatantly bad, like it really is, but if you've got you know a group of friends and you watch this movie to make fun of it, like you want that stuff, don't you? You want all that that bad action to to lap up. So even though it doesn't serve the movie at all, like would removing it improve it, or would it just make it like a worse bad movie? Hmm. I see what you're saying, but <laughs> I think we have different. I think we have different opinions about this film because I actually loved it, except for any human action. So the human talking was fine. Right. It's just some of these all these instances where they had to be fighting and had to do the Matrix style motorbike stuff, which I do. I don't like. So like, I I just I hated all of that. If that was gone, it, I, it would have been great, and this would have been one of my top Godzilla movies. Mm. Okay, um, but, I see what you're saying. Yeah, as as it's just it was just frustrating to see, and that that stuff just that just bores me. Yeah, I, I mean, that I, actually makes me bored. And it's like I know it's you know people flying around on motorbikes. It should be exciting, <laughs> but considering I know it's just yeah, it's just ripping off the Matrix. I'm just like, why this this doesn't have this does not have to be here. Um, I I'm really kind of hinging a lot on that because even though I'm complaining a lot about it, it's a small bugbear considering how much I actually really loved the rest of it. All right, fair enough e- then. Yeah, even yeah. though there was like, it was mostly incoherent and there are about a million different threads to follow. Um, I was constantly being entertained from start to finish, yeah, excluding those moments I just talked about. Um, so, yeah, I mean, overall, I I really, really liked it. But I'm guessing you hated it. Well, I didn't or hate at least it, got, no. you got enjoyment out of it in some some manner of speaking i guess to me its strongest merits were in its kind of bad movie night qualities and it's like things like when the kaiji is sort of kicking oh yeah they're kicking anguirus around like a football yeah they kick anguirus around like yeah. a football all that stuff is really fun yeah uh, but even for well yeah like for millennium era the action's been even in the less good movies it's been slightly more grounded so the action in this film from the kaijus is really over the top and very sort of cartoony um, uh, and then the the human action is the same. Like I know that they are trying to do the Matrix, but it's much more Looney Tunes than it is Matrix. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think if you're going to watch it, I think it's a great movie if you just want something to to take the piss out of. But is it a, yes. is it a good movie? Like, did I enjoy it? Like, not not greatly. I didn't. It didn't offend me the way some of the other weaker um, Millennium era movies have. 
but I felt like they just kind of they wanted to do the anniversary thing of like this is a big Godzilla thing it's like the last one of this era and we're going to do a big show and put all this stuff in it and they just threw everything at the wall and and it all of it stuck on this occasion, but yeah. there wasn't really any coherence to it at all. It's like, oh, we're going to see um, Godzilla and Zilla like fighting in Sydney, and we're going to put like this Sun 41 song over it, and it's going to be great. And it's like, what are you like? They just wanted that anniversary feeling of like hype and epicness and extreme, like satisfying moments so badly that they didn't actually think about like making a movie they just chucked a bunch of stuff in and were like yeah motorcycle fight it's gonna be so exciting and it kind of is in a funny way not in a genuine way but as an overall movie it's like what is this mess and you can't really deconstruct it without like you just have to kind of enjoy it for what it is which is just this big pile of things that don't kind of go together yeah i mean it's surface level entertainment really yeah i shouldn't really be you know trashing the um all the human action sequences so much if I'm taking yeah if I think about it that way mm. but I don't know it, that stopped it feeling like a Godzilla film it doesn't so feel though, like it, a Godzilla it, movie yeah you're right it doesn't so like like even though it was going to be a, the big anniversary you know the send off um, I, I expected there to be lots of incoherence and like a million monsters in there and like I was I was ready for that but just not that other aspect of it and it's like yeah you you stopped this being a Godzilla film now I feel like the reason it doesn't feel like a Godzilla movie. It's quite specific to the fact. It, it's specific to the the humans do not observe Godzilla in any way. When the big final fight is happening between Godzilla and Mothra's there and, and Gigan and all that, the yeah. humans are having their own drama. They're on the alien spaceship. They have that little fight. The bullets get stopped, blah, blah, blah. And no one's really aware or commenting on the fact that Godzilla is is doing stuff. I know that they've awoken Godzilla in you know, the Antarctic, and they wanted him to fight for, for yeah. them, and he is, but nobody is present, or there's no human reaction at any point to that that kaiju action, which makes it feel like it's totally separate. Exactly. Outside of having that little screen on the ship where you see the fight happening, I had forgotten what Godzilla was doing. I forgot he was he'd even surfaced and was fighting. Yeah. Because we're so busy watching these people fighting aboard this ship, they felt like two de- separate movies. It totally is, and that's that's the thing. It's like, if nobody in the cast is going to be like, Godzilla has succeeded, or if, if you're not going to show a civilian like running from Godzilla, it's stuff like that which can be easily taken for granted, where it's like, if nobody witnesses Godzilla doing his thing, like it feels like he hasn't done it at all. Hmm. And that's when you really get down to the, like, it does kind of feel like guys in suits, more so in this movie than the previous Millennium Era ones as well, because there's no contrast. You're just seeing, like, them fight, and the effects are good in this movie. Like, the fights are fun. Um, You know, it's a bit janky because of its age, and they do kind of, their reach exceeds their grasp kind of thing with the CGI a lot. But aside from all the fun stuff, they just didn't give it any context of, like, this is happening in you know a human world it just felt like guys in Godzilla suits like fighting yeah it was just yeah. bizarre because i think they really really uh, the main characters they only really mentioned godzilla once and that was when they were going to go resurrect him yeah and they're sort of like they and then, then little... i don't think they spoke about him after that no and you, you're <laughs> kind of supposed to feel that like they formed a little team and godzilla is a member of it but it doesn't feel like that at all there's no yeah. camaraderie or threat from the kaijus at all the closest you get is with manila the son of godzilla yeah and like i but there's only like what two or three very short scenes with that in and that's the that's the closest it felt like a connection to the characters and this bigger threat because they were on their way to somewhere and it felt like there's an anticipation but you didn't get that with the the other people because they're just doing their thing you know Mm, and that felt very much like they just put manila in so they could have that last shot at the end where the boy protects the monsters and then manila Mm. Manila protects the humans and it's like good trailer footage yeah they just (laughs) a lot of it was that like let's put in motorcycle let's put in loads of kaijus even if it's just for a little bit and even if they don't make sense of why they're there um we just you know we have all this stuff to show you and it's just there to enjoy and that's the thing is like if you enjoy just looking at stuff like this has got it for you Mm. like get some Mm. drinks get some friends and you're gonna have a blast like with this film but as an actual like coherent film there it wasn't it just is so far from from the quality we've been used to in the rest of the series and that's with the poorer millennium era movies like we're standing i wouldn't say this is worse than like mega gearus which is still my bottom (laughs) Because there's more fun stuff in here, like, you know, the kaiju fights are so zany. 
it's like you've got to love it but still like there wasn't a story and i found myself just bored i feel most of it because it's mostly humans just talking and stuff and like i don't know i, I that's the thing actually we could both rattle off a list of things that happens in, in this film because of all the exciting action. But if you asked me to tell you or, de- or describe a dialogue scene, I don't, couldn't mm-hmm. remember a single one. Because they just sort of like, you know, just go past and don't leave an impact. It's just like white noise. It's very dense with stuff. Mm. Just just stuff. <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just stuff. Um, I mean... All right, we've got like a million monsters in this as well. Yeah. So, okay, let, we've got Godzilla, Rodan, Anguirus, Godzilla 98, the American Godzilla, uh, King Caesar, the fluffy guardian lion from Versus Mechagodzilla, uh-huh. Kamakurus, the praying mantis from Son of Godzilla, Komonga, the spider from Son of Godzilla, Amanda, the sea dragon serpent thing, who I actually initially thought was Ghidorah in some way. Um, you got uh, Ebera, the lobster thing from <laughs> Horror of the Deep. Gigan, Mothra, Manila, the son of Godzilla. Hedora, the smog monster, and then Kaiser Ghidorah. Um, sake. Yeah, so it's like a, it's a epic list. It was a lot to focus on, but I think it was when it comes to the monsters. I think it was done well because I understand that they wanted to have a big back catalogue of monsters that hadn't been used for years mm. and like this this is the time to do it and i think it was done well because even though he can't like godzilla could pretty much just wipe them out in about five seconds i, I didn't really care you know made him look strong that was the whole idea to kind of big up godzilla yes it's just the so, greatest hits basically isn't it i mean yeah yes exactly they've kind of just made it a big godzilla party because it was the 50th anniversary of the series so in final wars they've got like all your favorites back and they just went really hard on like shoving everything into this movie so that's why there's so many kaijus and so much effort put into making it like extreme because they were like, oh yeah, 50th anniversary, make it the best it can be. And it's all kind of in service of very little in the end. <laughs> but, essentially, yeah. Um, so, I mean, Godzilla in this film, he's, because we kind of talk about, the, you know, the character of Godzilla in each movie, if we can. And I feel like this one actually probably had the best explanation for, you know, the angry Godzilla because mm. he was, he was not really allied with humans he wasn't allied with them and not against them either yeah, so, neutral I mean, stance. yes yeah. which i actually really like because he was angry at mankind for all the catastrophes they've caused so that's why he's trampling the city but also still fighting off the monsters so it's like it was simple you know it's logical and still sympathetic it's, in my opinion it's like he's protecting the earth he's not protecting the humans he's protecting the planet and it's like the humans have been bad to the planets so they you know they're an enemy of godzilla yeah exactly so, and kind like, of, yeah I feel like that that was the best explanation, and that was that was coming from that um, that you know the guy that was with um, Manila, you know the, the the sniper in the woods who takes his, I assume his grandson around <laughs> the woods. I don't know. God, no, I don't know what he was, was about. Was he hunting? Well, it, this this is why I asked you if you watched <laughs> the Japanese version because I was sure something was cut out of the dubbed version because it just like snaps to them like almost mid conversation where he's, the son's like don't shoot at, at that and it's Manila and the old man's like okay, I guess I won't shoot at that thing because um, that seems to be how most of the characters speak for the entire movie um, <laughs> and yeah that's how they're introduced so I guess they were sort of out hunting or maybe the grandson was visiting the grandpa and he was like just protecting the house at that moment with his gun because he thought something was coming it's unclear it would have been nice to have a little bit more on that. I, I wish they had focused more on those because th- th- I thought that was really good. Yeah. The, um, that little that little arc was really nice and I felt like we were missing something there. And we've got the uh, the bad CGI 98 <laughs> Godzilla. And I was like, they've purposely made this bad, surely. And then I looked it up and apparently they um, they just they scanned a 3D toy. <laughs> they like, did a 3D scan of a toy that was released in 1998 and they basically just slapped that in and like that would do. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's fine. I th- thought it was quite funny. That, I mean, maybe you didn't like that at all. No, I mean... It, I maybe like... Because, I mean, the song that they used, that Sun 41 song, <laughs> like, we're all to blame. So it's kind of like, they're, they're also accepting the blame as the world kind of, you know, laments its existence. When I saw Sun 41 were in the opening credits, I haven't thought about Sun 41 
from over a decade it was just like oh my god here we go like this movie is going to be a certain kind of movie yeah. but i think yeah i mean obviously they wanted to vindicate godzilla fans globally by showing godzilla kill the american godzilla which i think canonically is called zilla um so fair enough it was just a laugh wasn't it i didn't think it looked especially bad um but it was seemed like this movie I mean, I, I say it didn't look that bad in the context of the overall film because the CGI okay. on the whole is not great. I mean, there's a shot where Rodan is just flying around and he just hasn't got any like motion to his wings or limbs. He's just like completely mm-hmm. static and he just like zips about and it's like, okay, you could have animated it, but fine. Um, so yeah, I wasn't surprised they scared the toy. It felt very much like the whole movie had been made on the same budget of all the other Millennium Mirror movies, except they'd done like 10 times the stuff. And yeah, it feels yeah. like it's actually the sets that, that suffer the most rather than the special effects of the kaijus. That's kind of where the money is, even though it doesn't look great. The previous two films had tanked. Oh, so I didn't probably weren't, Yeah, they probably weren't feeling too um, too brave with this one. So, yeah, it's quite, quite a different one. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, because like... You, having that uh having zilla in there for a start like it was really i think taking into account a lot of the west as well with this film mm. and like you had the sum 41 song as well but also the music was entirely well almost entirely composed by uh this british prog rock band called emerson lake and palmer never heard of them at i hadn't heard of them before either uh palmer was apparently a drummer for crazy world of arthur brown and asia who i know of <laughs> uh lake was part of Cri- uh, king crimson and Emerson was part of the Nice, who I've never heard of. No. Um, like, not my kind of music, but like, it fit fit the fit the mood of the film very well. I thought, like, you had that first scene with the like the electronic, dramatic, mm. operatic score. It kind of set the mood for the rest of it. And I thought it was quite brave of them to do that because for the final movie, I didn't think they would farm off the soundtrack to Western composers. It's really strange. Well, I think it's deliberately done that way because they wanted to have a global feel. Like at the beginning, they make out like, you know, the human race has been fighting kaijus for like 100 years and all that stuff mm. is established. And they bring in, um, you know, the white guy with the moustache who's like, I'm the one who defeated Godzilla with my bazooka and all that stuff. Is like they want to bring in a lot of global characters from different places. So it feels like, oh, when you watch this, it's not just a Japanese thing. It's like everybody's in it together. And the Sum 41 and the westernized soundtrack and the, the white characters is probably all in service of them trying to market it abroad. Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of it took place in Australia as well. Yeah. I suppose that's nearby. So but. I think that was just their attempt to be like, look, we've done like Matrixy stuff and there's like non-Japanese actors in this film and please mm. watch Godzilla and please like don't let it die, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. So, yeah. but it just sort of was like, it's all lip service ultimately, like there's no real substance to that. <laughs> um, well, the, uh, that, the, the white guy, mm-hmm. the main guy, um, Douglas Gordon, Captain Douglas Gordon. <laughs> Uh, so he's played by Don Fry, who was a who was famous briefly in Japan as a mixed martial artist. Oh, so like he he was known there. Makes sense. And, I would have assumed yeah. so. Yeah, I I thought maybe it's just because he looked like Hagger from Final Fight, and they're like, yeah, you'll do. <laughs> but yeah, apparently he's known. So um, yeah, uh, so yeah, we have got Captain Gordon. You got uh, Ozaki slash Neo. Um, Even looks like Keanu Reeves. I know, right? I thought that it's as well. It's very deliberate casting. Though. Very, yeah, very funny. Not as good an actor as Keanu Reeves, and that may be saying yeah, I something. Think about the about the same, right? <laughs> um, in the right in the right role, Keanu Reeves is great, but he's often miscast. I think is the problem. Okay, so that could be true for this guy. Yeah, absolutely, we we can only judge them on what we've seen. <laughs> it's true. Um, and you got uh, Miyuki Otanashi, the biologist, Anna Otanashi, who's that news journalist who is the sister of Miyuki and is going out with Captain Gordon. That all went over my head. Yeah, right? I, I didn't notice until the second time. Oh, I'm oblivious to romance, apparently. <laughs> yeah, it was, just, uh, it was just like, again, this is all these threads, like trying to pull them together. It's like, oh, you all know each other? It's just very strange. But well, it, yeah, It was pretty clear there was another kind of sexless romance between the, the two leads, because in all of the Millennium mm. movies, it feels like there's a male and a female and... 
they never like kiss or they never well no. they never they never get together either. no but it's always inferred that they are co- going to once the credits have rolled you can exactly. imagine that they do and it's like just show them having like a snog i mean i'm not yeah. really here for it but that's kind of what you're going for so just do it because wasn't it's it weird wasn't it when i think it was it anna came in with us and uh, and saw her sister with the uh, ozaki she's like oh I like your boyfriend or something like that mm. and it's like and she's like no he's not my boyfriend oh he, he is so but he's... then he might be later on it's just oh yeah i just that felt like drives it, me nuts it's always so annoying when you're watching something and like dark knight rises is a good example of this i know this irks you to no end <laughs> where it's like the final scene's happening the city's about to explode but batman and catwoman still have got time for a kiss it's so lame but yeah. i can accept it of like a ne- well an evil not necessarily a necessary evil but it's a thing that you see in in movies and then kind of in these godzilla movies where they don't do it it actually is more annoying somehow because you're like you're kind of having your cake and eating it too it's like yeah. they, are, they are having a romance but we're not going to see them actually like have a kiss and it's like either do it or don't do it it's just so annoying <laughs> maybe it's a cultural thing I think it is I think it's all about public display of affection and all of that stuff yeah I was going to say we should talk a bit more about the characters but there were so many and not, <laughs> not a lot of them had a lot of impact and well, there was like a, like a million cameos actually there was one interesting cameo go on uh you remember that kind of like little news show where they're debating stuff mm. on TV? Um, oh yeah, that was great. Yeah, that was great but with the, the weird makeup on that tanned guy and yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. They uh, all looked like they were from some Capcom video game as well. They did actually. the The girl in that she uh, in that scene, she was the one that was like strapped to the hospital bed in All Out Attack. <laughs> and that really funny scene. scene yeah, where yeah, she tries that, to that get was away. <laughs> So that was probably my favourite cameo of the bunch. Is it a cameo or is that just them reusing an actor? They do it all the time. Like, I, each time we've done one of these, I've had a look at the, um, the kind of the cast list and the cameos. Mm. There's always absolute tons. Yeah. And I, I never want to mention them because it's certainly so interesting, really, isn't it? So, <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah they, much, they do it like, a lot. Um, much like homage and copying, you know, or ripping off rather, I think it's where, is it a cameo or is it just that they have the same the same actor there's like a difference to me (laughs) um that was a really good scene the newsroom scene where the guy was like i don't believe in aliens and then the other guy was like there's blatantly aliens here (laughs) he was like "Mm, i don't think so yeah it's really spoke it it kind of was maybe more um topical to today's media than it was back in 2004 yeah i think you're right (laughs) (laughs) who knew (laughs) um yeah so there were there were characters (laughs) there certainly was yes the guy who was playing X was probably going for sort of oh, a, like a Jim Carrey type type thing, which was weird. Like in his radio interview, that was weird. It's like keep your face still for a second. Strangely <laughs> naturalistic scene where they were sort of talking over each other. Yeah, that was weird. It was very. Yeah, I didn't expect that. Uh, the DJ was like trying to move on. Uh, yes. from the whole X is my name, and it was like this is. It was obviously supposed to be funny. And it was kind of like, it's not funny, but there was like a little hint of like, there's little, there's something there they could have done more with. Like if that was seen and gone on longer, I think it probably would have become funnier as it went on. And uh, this kind of goes back to what I mean. Like those, all those moments I thought were good. Mm. And get rid of the motorbike, <laughs> get rid of the motorbike scene. Have a 10 what? minute radio interview scene. Not 10 minutes, but you know <laughs> what I mean? Just yeah. like building a little more on these smaller segments. But you, you basically, you've got 30 seconds of, it's, it's like a, giant two-hour clip show yes you know it's yeah it's a lot it's a lot to take in what did you think of the uh monster fights then um this is the thing is that i think i would have loved them a lot more if they'd been in a movie where it felt like they had impact as isolated scenes they had like really fun ideas and like comical action and that was good but i'm not the kind of guy who just goes on youtube and watches kaiju fights out of context or anything like that. I want mm, there to yeah. be some, you know, weight to what's happening. And I know they tried to establish like all monsters are being controlled by the aliens and they're going to destroy Earth. And that was laid out at the beginning. But nobody in the film seemed to be affected or really care that those kaiju fights were happening. So even though they were like so bombastic and over the top and that was really fun, and I think you could have a great laugh watching them. In the context of the movie, it just became more 
like white noise. I was just like, oh, I guess this is happening. And it sort of detracted from the enjoyment. And I think if they'd been maybe more endearing human characters or at least just some shots or some establishment of like people being afraid or like stuff like that, I would have mm. been like, oh, this is actually happening. It just felt like stuff more stuff i know we keep saying stuff <laughs> but it was just like oh here's some kaiju stuff and i was like well without any kind of weight to it it doesn't really matter how crazy it got because things are it's when you need a bit of contrast um to make those fun things as fun as they can be and if you're just going all out weird and wild it does kind of lose some of its impact when it's not put in any sort of like story or structure it's just like, okay this is, this is happening yeah no you're, you're absolutely right I think when I was watching it the first time over, um, because I was expecting that, like I say, for there to be more impact, I was I was expecting there, I was expecting it to have an impact. So when I was watching them, I was like, oh, this is great, this is crazy. I suppose <laughs> because I was, I was of the mindset that it was all gonna, kind of come together. Mm. It felt quite exciting. But then, yeah, on reflection and seeing it the second time, they were just like separate sequences completely. Uh, you know, it's just, oh, here's some here's some crazy fights. Oh, back, yeah. to, back to Ozaki on a motorbike. I got that feeling quite early on, to be honest, because that first shot of Angiris, and then again when you see Angiris being used as a football later in the movie, it's all kind of done in a very isolated way. And it's just like, you have the human drama, we're going to cut to some kaijus, and we're going to cut cut back to the humans and the humans again they just don't even mention it or really react to it it's just like that happened the closest is that guy with manila yeah um yeah. which is again like it's just a separate episode within this movie that could be extracted and neither the film or the manila plotline would suffer from being separated entirely like mm. because they just don't coalesce at all and it's that thing of like we're cutting between different story threads and they don't have any sort of intermingling in any way and it's just like okay, so you just come, you just didn't care about what was going on. No, it's true. There was one moment where uh, there was kind of an interaction between the kaiju and the humans. Well, it was the mutants, really. Where that um, petrochemical plant, mm. where there were cars flying around and exploding for some reason. <laughs> I, don't I, even I, I that. watched it twice and I couldn't <laughs> figure out why they were flying around, but oh, they were. Pass me by. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's where they like composited the the humans into the scene and they ended up looking like borrowers rather than the monsters <laughs> looking like huge. <laughs> but that that was the closest we had to, yeah, kind of any threat to humans. And they weren't even human anyway, so <laughs> I think, like you said, um, the director was very concerned with there being too much boring human stuff and not enough kaiju action. So it feels like there's actually been a concerted effort to construct very um extreme kaiju scenes and just have them happen in the movie and be like these are just there and the humans don't matter and we're not going to get preoccupied of human drama but then also with the same motivation they've set down they've sat down as a team and said how can we make the humans more interesting mm. and they've given them loads of action scenes and loads of protracted dialogue and this guy's a mutant so that's interesting right and you know this guy comes from space, so he's an alien. And it's like, all of this effort has been put into making that exciting, but it's all in, you know, because the two don't come together in any way, it's like, yeah, you have these exciting kaiju scenes and you have all these action scenes with humans, but it's just not coherent. And it does feel like that's all been motivated by previous boredom where you've watched a movie where it's like the humans are just boring and just there and it's like we don't want you know we've criticized these things enough ourselves we've said like oh the humans were dull and there was too much of the humans and that has been a problem but you do need just basic humans sometimes because yeah. otherwise the kaijus don't feel special at all it feels like i feel like there was a three-hour movie here <laughs> that, for better or worse yeah it could have been really good or really bad either way uh. You know, if there was more attention to the actual human element, more uh, character development, rather. Um, but I mean, they, they even cut loads of monster stuff as well. So, Did like, they? They, yeah, there's going to be more um, of Hedera. Uh, but, and that happened, that was like a 30 second scene. It was great where they like pushed Hedera. The building. The building got like pushed back. That was so good. Like that was it, one of my favorite moments. <laughs> one of my favorite scenes was the American scene. Where the, there was a scene in, oh, in America where a policeman was having a altercation with two black guys, and it was just like 
the worst kind of stereotyping I've seen in a Godzilla movie, I think, where it's just like, this is America, I guess. Yeah, this pastiche uh, of what uh, Japanese people think New York is like based you know, on video games or something. Well, I think it was all based on like Roland Emmerich stuff because obviously he did Godzilla, <laughs> right? The 98 one. Um, yeah. There was flavours of... Um, independence day in here like they did they did cut uh, a little bit to people like watching tv and stuff yes. a few times and all those kind of like box pops kind of stuff which is like oh here's some people around the world watching the events in this unfold in this disaster movie which is all emmerich stuff and i think like yeah it was a pastiche of america and it was quite egregious even by japanese standards yeah really but was. that's what roland emmerich does to in american movies like when you watch independence day that's kind of like to a lesser extent what you see so if you're I taking it, so. yeah. So it's almost like they just saw it through a Japanese like filter, and it got a bit worse. But, but yeah, I loved like the big pimp jacket, um, and then the, when their hats got like blown off, they that's had like this it, little like whipping cartoon that, sound effect. That seems like like it'd be like a recurring joke in a South Park episode, <laughs> like that bit. It was. It, I found it really funny. Why could it have been a recurring joke in this movie? Why that would have been great. Loads of hats could have got oh, blown mate. off. Like, oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, like every like 15, 20 minutes, somebody's hat gets like whipped off. and you Someone's wearing like, a hat for Whoop. some reason. Yeah. <laughs> so that was so funny, but also it was funny for the wrong reasons. Yeah, definitely. It was weird because that scene um, in the Japanese language version, that scene's in English, obviously, um, <laughs> but they dubbed it. Well, it's all like weird, like ADR, isn't it? it all, yeah, yeah, but they, and the thing is, I think it's because like the cop, you could see him mouthing the um, F word. Oh. And I, I think they probably thought, well, that's too much. Let's just make him say something else instead. So they just dubbed him completely. It's re- just really weird. So I, I'm guessing, I can't remember what it was like in the English language version, whether they dubbed the dub or not. Well, I think <laughs> I they can't did. Remember. Because even um, this guy, what's this, this mustachioed man called? I can't remember. Hagger. Oh, Captain Gordon. <laughs> Captain Gordon. He's dubbed, even in the dub, even though it's like, well, he was probably speaking yeah, English. Yeah. And it's just a sound thing, I think, which is that we've got to dub everything. Yeah, I like suppose, for the sake yeah. of consistency, I suppose it's worth doing. The best voice award, again, goes to child being voiced by a middle-aged woman. <laughs> uh, probably one of the finest examples of what little boys don't sound like. Yes. Yeah. And I don't know at what point in human history... Did that become a thing? I mean, I know Bart I think, Simpson. Is, yeah, I was gonna say it's a Nancy Cartwright thing, isn't it? Probably. I mean, or Rugrats, Bart, I suppose. Mm, but those voices, they don't sound like kids, I guess. I mean, Bart Simpson. I think Bart does. He sounds not like a middle-aged woman, and also not like a ten-year-old boy. To me, he just sounds like Bart. It's weird. Mm. But then, like in Rugrats, like Chucky Finkster, it's it's a good voice, and you don't listen to it and say like, "Oh, that's a woman talking." But in right, these movies, in, mm. in these films, it's just so blatantly obvious. Like, that is, like, a woman in her late 30s just going, Oh, Grandpa! Yeah. Don't, don't shoot! And it's just like, who yeah, It wouldn't have been like difficult that? to get a kid. I'm guessing it would just be more expensive, and that the woman who's doing that voice is probably doing at least one other voice in the movie. I think it's the same people, because I swear the voice of... Um, the voice of the biologist... Mm. I think that was the same voice actor that did Akane in... Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. Would make sense that they just have a, a pool of actors who, yeah. do, who work for a good fee and they just go back <laughs> and say, will you do another Godzilla? And like, yep, job and actor just comes in and completely devoid of passion does the voiceover of the movie. Oh, <laughs> wow. There you go. <laughs> so no, no real effort was put in with this stuff. I guess they did it on the cheap because like you say, like the franchise was in a, a cheap phase. They didn't have much money to, to, to work with. I think that's probably always been the case for Godzilla, but then I suppose as time progresses, it becomes noticeably worse. Mm. Uh, like I suppose, true to form, I'm trashing this quite a lot. But yeah, but you loved it. <laughs> I I really enjoyed it, and I would happily watch again. And just you know, I I know, I know what to expect when it comes to the human action sequences. So I can just go, okay, fine, whatever. I thought they were great action sequences as long as you like really bad action yeah see i uh, i don't know whether i do or not i think i've got to be in the right mood yes yes well that's that's true of a lot of things i suppose and i would say that the matrix reloaded is one of the worst hollywood movies made in ever 
it really is terrible. But Take that, Wachowskis. It's kind of an insult, though, to Reload. It's when this movie comes out and copies it, and it's just like, oh, it's really, <laughs> you know, it makes Reload look a little bit better than it is. Not in a story sense, but the action, like, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. The action in Reloaded is, has never been the worst part of it, I guess. So mm. it's just strange to watch this and feel, like, nostalgic for that stuff. Like, mm, yeah, I really wish I was watching Reloaded instead of watching this bad version of it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right, actually. Yeah. And, like and like with the mutants it felt like it just reminded me of like you know the mutant academy in x-men yes independence day it reminded me of that as Mm. well like you got the big scary ufo hanging over the city and then you got the trench run from star wars (laughs) and it's just like they did he didn't have to do that he didn't have to do any of that and it would have been far better rather than being nostalgic for better films I think its strength its strengths really lay in the in the fights. To be honest, mm. uh, that's where it felt mo- most Godzillary to me, and I think they did it sublimely because I, I thought I thought the fights were so good. And he was saying, uh, the director, he wanted to, to go back to like you know the seventies era of yeah. fighting. Yeah, it definitely it had f- that vibe. It, f- it felt like that, but like really fast. Mm. And like you know, we, and like these crazy moments, like with a uh, Gigan with his chainsaw hands, and like he pulls himself <laughs> along the floor and stuff like that. It's just like it's just. It was really exciting. It made, it made me wish I was watching those seventies era, though. Just... I I agree with that. Actually, it did make me want to go back to yeah. those more. Like all the best parts of this movie just make you wish, make you wish you were watching a different movie. But that's where like he wants to do a celebration of mm. Godzilla, yeah. and that's where I feel like he did it well. Yeah. So okay, I'll concede that. I mean, yeah. all of it, like the aliens included, are just like let's just get all the Godzilla stuff and do it again. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess by I, I don't like that idea but they did it and yeah hooray they succeeded i suppose in some context i'm i'm, I'm glad that they decided to take a break after this because i was saying there were, like there wouldn't be another one for at least a decade after this because they'd been starting to flop yeah and, and they get quite samey as well having watched the millennium era in reasonably close proximity there's good ones there's bad ones but even so they're not like that different in, in in story and tone not particularly no no it's like we loved all out attack it's great and then mega Gears is like bad but then i think if you said to like a non-fan like well, these two movies are different right they'd be like no <laughs> they're the same <laughs> so, probably probably <laughs> yeah this is, we see this in video games where there's like an annual release mm. of a game like call of duty or assassin's creed or something it just dilutes anything special about it and yeah it just becomes this amalgam of of its time I mean, not only is it like a you know, celebration of everything that's gone before, but it's also kind of like actually saying goodbye to it all as well. Mm. Because this, apparently, um, the uh, Toho Studios, they had something called the Big Pool, which is where for the last 40 years they'd done all their water scenes yeah. and things like that. And they and they destroyed it mm. just to make, make better use of the space because they're moving from analog to digital. And like, you know, effects were getting better digitally. And it really was, I think, just kind of, yeah, it was like the final nail in the coffin for the way of making Godzilla movies. Yes. And it's, it's kind of sad, but I mean, you got to change with the times. There's no point clinging on to it, especially in business. And it was the first Godzilla film to be shot digitally, actually. Um, and like, yeah, it, it makes it makes business sense. Um, well, sometimes it's good to do that, though, isn't it? Because like, yes, they're doing it for a business reason. But as you say, creatively speaking... If they've got this big pool there, like that basically means every movie's going to use the big pool. Um, every movie's going to look the same. Yeah, you just start seeing the same things. Yeah. And it's like, you know, maybe just shake it up a bit and don't become so formulaic. And if yeah. that means filling in the big pool, then yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that's what I mean. So I'm glad they took that break and they were like, let's not just keep running this. It's yeah. not working. Let's, let's forget it. It clearly and needed I'm, it. Like, I'm glad they did. If people weren't going to see them, then yeah. audiences wanted a break and yeah. the franchise needed a break and that's kind of fine. And then they come back with Shin Godzilla, which won an award. Arguably which one I of think the best was, ones. Yeah. yeah, easily. So yeah, it was absolutely the best decision. So, But I mean, I still like the movie, so I thought it was a good send-off. Um, I liked it as much that it was a silly film. I think I would watch it again with you or with other group of friends to just like, have a mm. laugh. Yeah, but I was disappointed it wasn't more of that all-out attack quality. It was just like this is just a good movie on its own. I mean, to go back to what we always say, like, would you show this to like a first-time Godzilla viewer? I think my answer would probably be no because it is like celebratory. Like, you want to know some of those references. 
I thought the same. Yeah. yeah. I th- I think a first time viewer could see it and still enjoy it, but there's something about having a bit more history behind Godzilla that would make it stand out a bit more. But it's also that the story is not the best, and I would say, like, aside from it being a celebration movie, I would say if you're going to watch Godzilla for the first time, make sure you pick one that's actually, like, got the whole package, where it's, like, great action, likeable human characters with a coherent story, watch All Out Attack. Um, It's the best one for that. And Final Wars is just there for, you know, your silly popcorn night where it's just kind of on in the background and you look up when you hear a motorcycle and have a giggle, (laughs) and then you go back to whatever you were doing. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that's not really what you want for your big like 50th anniversary send off but it is good for that in my opinion so yeah and you know if you like leather then you'll certainly like this film I think I don't like leather myself so. oh well maybe that's why you didn't like maybe it that was the whole that was the <laughs> crux of the matter uh, no yeah I, 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 I do agree with you actually I think you made a good point because I, I did initially think yeah newcomers could watch it but then yeah I feel like you would be missing out and maybe be in danger of being a bit bored because you don't know why all these monsters like what they're even from yeah if you've got no history of godzilla then you'd be like what's the point yeah, of it it, it, it would mean nothing like for example when you see hedera it's like oh why is there this big galoopy thing come from the sea <laughs> exactly and it dies like, immediately and and then you got you know you know manila looking like baby sinclair running <laughs> around it's just you were like, what is this? So yeah, that's a good point. And whenever, whenever we bring this up, like, should you show a first time viewer this it, to introduce them? It's in the context of if if you do show them one that, that's not so good, you know, this hypothetical friend that you're introducing to the series, if they have a bad experience, then it might just be like, oh, that's what Godzilla is then. And think yes. that every single movie is just going to be like random, you know, crowbarred in kaiju scenes. Mm. So I think, yeah, for a first time viewer, avoid this one because they'll probably get the wrong and the wrong end of the stick for what Godzilla is normally like because it does have like a half decent story most of the time yeah completely agree so I mean that's that then that's the end of an era literally (laughs) uh so we'd love to know what you guys thought of this movie because I mean I mean I think between uh you and me Graham like we have different differing opinions of this Mm -hmm. which is good uh, but there's always some middle ground, I think. I just, again, I want to know if people think we're just like way off the mark because, from what I understand, people love this film, and I, I want to know why. <laughs> tell us, tell us why you love it. Do you love all those Matrix-style scenes, etc., etc.? Just, just let us know. Okay, so you you can speak to us on Twitter, it's Monster Island RP, on Instagram, it's Monster Island Radio, and uh, YouTube channel as well, which is Monster Island Radio. Uh, yeah, we'd we'd love to hear your thoughts. So, until next time, everyone. Bye. Bye.